I don't know how many of you are familiar with Los Angeles, but Los Angeles is actually a major oil producer. Um, driving around Los Angeles uh, by freeway or just taking local streets, you can often see oil derricks pumping oil out of the ground, uh, even to this day. Not that I can get back there to check, but the last time I was there and throughout my childhood, you could uh, just go through random neighborhoods or go for hikes and you would see oil derricks. Los Angeles actually produces a lot of oil as does the rest of the United States. This is not a photograph of uh, LA oil production. It is outside of Baku in Azerbaijan. Thought that it would be relevant given the current ongoing conflict that's going on between Azerbaijan and Armenia, not directly related uh, to oil, but due to the colonial uh, artifacts of um, borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan after the end of the Cold War. But that's besides the point. Today I want to talk about natural resources and conflict. And as with a lot of things, um, natural resources can be a mixed blessing. As with Los Angeles, it can provide uh, revenue uh, for the state and local governments. For Azerbaijan, it is a crucial part of the Azerbaijani economy. But uh, natural resources can also lead to corruption, lack of development, and uh, autocratic governments that are hard to get rid of. So today I want to talk about natural resources and conflict and to see how the kind of resources that we all use and depend on um, in our day-to-day -day lives end up having downstream uh, and upstream effects both on where the minerals um, and other resources come from that make up cell phones and everything else that we depend on in our modern, uh, modern lives, but then also downstream where all this detritus of humanity goes once we're done using it. Um, I've been meaning to recycle my old cell phones. I haven't done it yet. Um, but these things that we use uh, every day come from someplace. Uh, a huge complex machinery has been developed over the last couple hundred years uh, through the miracles of globalization and technological innovation has made our lives better, longer, and I would argue richer. Um, but it has negative effects often on the countries that produce the things that we depend on, as well as uh, the earth that we all live on. So today, while the focus is going to be on, um, often on oil as the resource that a lot of us think of when we think about natural resources and conflict, but you can uh, apply it in a whole bunch of uh, interesting ways. So we want to try to understand, uh, and the, today's motivating uh, question is how do natural resources affect a country's political and economic stability. Um, every country has a different distribution of capital, land, and labor. Different countries are stronger in one or the other. Uh, Singapore might not have that much land, but it has uh, a labor that often um, is uh, comes from outside. It's a globalized city, as well as a lot of uh, economic uh, capital. Um, other uh, countries that we've seen so far might be more abundant in uh, land, like uh, in uh, Australia, but are relatively labor scarce. And so all these different countries have different natural resource allocations. How does that affect how, the, how stable the country is, how the country develops either economically or, or politically? And so that's the motivating question. How can we understand the, the mixed relations between natural resources and political and economic outcomes of the kind that political scientists and international relations scholars uh, are focused on? And this is a topic that is near and dear to me. I wrote my master's thesis on natural resources and the connections to conflict. It was a qualitative um, thesis that looked at different types of resources, oil, diamonds, uh, timber, and looked at different cases in which these resources had a contributing factor to conflict onset or duration and those that didn't. And often you can see a lot of the cases of um, countries with endemic conflict, long-running conflict, like uh, Democratic Republic of Congo or Afghanistan, and the resources that these countries have 
um, should be able to transform uh, the economy and the opportunities that people have within the countries, given the sheer amount of value that these resources have. Um, we've talked a, a lot about um, DRC and, and other cases later on today. I'm going to be talking about uh, South Sudan, but Afghanistan um, is another case in which you have a country that is that is um, had challenges going back to the uh, Soviet invasion uh, and afterwards, but. There's been recent discoveries of, um, I mean, people have always known that Afghanistan has a lot of different uh, resources under the ground, but new technologies and new exploration estimates of between one and three trillion dollars of resources are underneath the ground. And so there's, uh, there was hope a couple of years ago that the discovery of these resources should provide incentives for peace, um, but as this quote from President uh, Ghani suggests that they are at risk of the curse of plenty, the curse of resources. So this understanding that resources can be a curse has uh, permeated uh, not just uh, academia and academic research on conflict uh, and economic development, but policymakers and uh, the general society. So you have these countries that have this enormous, enormous wealth, um, but it takes uh, a whole bunch of other different factors to help let lead to political and economic stability. And this is far from guaranteed, and there's a lot of cases in which uh, resources end up being a curse. And so today we want to look at how those um, stories unfold and the many different ways uh, that different actors can get involved uh, that could end up leading to conflict. So um, in Afghanistan, it's uh, minerals, platinum, silver, copper, iron, chromite, gold, lithium, uranium, aluminum, right? I forgot my wedding ring uh, today. Family's at home. It's been a fun, long weekend, so I, I don't have any gold. Uh, I have my um, key uh, bowl here in my spanking new office that is made out of silver. Um, the mining of silver is also something that uh, has been crucial for humanity going back uh, millennia. Uh, I visited the Potosi mine in Bolivia, and you can see a, a, a hillside, a hill that's been visibly diminished after hundreds of years of people actually uh, taking silver out of this uh, incredibly rich uh, mine. Other resources we might not think about, and we're going to discuss today about the number of different resources that humanity uses. Last week we talked about um, bat and seabird guano as a crucial resource in the 19th century. Uh, horseshoe crabs uh, is a, a, a current resource that people are worried about overusing um, in 2020. This amazing and uh, confounding year. Horseshoe crabs are now crucial for the development of possible vaccines for COVID-19. Horseshoe crab blood has unique characteristics that make it uh, important for um, uh, developing these vaccines. I don't fully understand it. Uh, I included a link to the article here, uh, and there's been efforts to try to come up with synth synthetic uh, substitutes in the last couple decades. Uh, initially, people thought that taking the blue blood from horseshoe crabs only led to 3% uh, deaths. Estimates now are saying that 30%, um, 10 times higher, can, can die in order to provide this resource that we need to be able to return to hopefully something like a normal life. So traditional resources uh, like silver uh, can be used uh, for um, centuries. Others like horseshoe crabs, due to technological innovation and advancement, um, can become something that has uh, incredible value uh, as well as a, a resource that's non-renewable. We're gonna talk about that. So yeah, the main kind of puzzle for today for me and why I got into this field is it's usually considered an asset to have money, uh, to have resource that you convert into something like money that you can use for something that you want. And it makes me think about lottery winners in the United States that people, they've, um, academics have done studies of lottery winners five, ten years down the line, almost all of them have spent all their money and end up uh, not seeing it as a, as, a, as a windfall and how these assets can end up being paradoxically problematic and uh, how these kind of resources can lead to negative outcomes like Dutch disease, 
the natural resource curse, like President um, Ghani talked about, and even uh, civil conflict, which is uh, the main focus for today's class. So we're going to look at a couple of different resources and mechanisms for how resources can lead people to do things um, that can end up being destabilizing to a country. We are now in, it is amazing to say, week nine of this 12-week course. And so we've started with the, the human realm initially, looking at uh, political and economic reasons for conflict. Then we looked at specific resources, starting with people, because we are uh, a social science, uh, how people, where they are, when they move, what they need to survive, like water and food. Now I'm kind of taking a step back, connecting it to those previous uh, weeks when water is considered a natural uh, resource um, that's non-renewable in a direct kind of sense, agricultural production, food production, how that can lead to conflict with a changing uh, climate uh, and bring people into conflict or um, dependent on international prices of commodities. Today we're looking at natural resources, what is relatively static in the natural world that the humans depend on besides water and food. And then next week we're gonna look at natural disasters, how the natural world is not necessarily static, um, but these changes, some slow moving, some fast moving, can also create political and economic instability uh, and conflict. So this week we're looking at levels, uh, long-term, uh, nature of um, resource bases within a country and next week we're going to look at quick shifts uh, to that shocks to the system the changes and how that can lead uh, to conflict and then for the last two weeks we're going to look at um, domestic and international responses I thought it would be interesting today to look at some of the international responses to natural resources and conflict um, as a kind of um, uh, a quick kind of peek at the international multilateral responses to these kind of challenges um, that we're going to see at the end of the semester. So yeah, last uh, in this introduction, I wanted to kind of draw your attention to some of the elements of the assigned reading for this week's class. Uh, this artic article by McCartan Humphreys, every time I come back to it, I am I find something new in it and the ambition the detail and the, the, the development uh, in, of alternate causal mechanisms and the ability to explain it, I thought was really excellent. So it's one of those um, articles that's had incredible importance in shaping our understanding of natural resources and conflict, as well as an example of a really well thought out uh, research design and, and writing. It had a great abstract that um, provided an overview for the class which should be useful for those students who are trying to write research proposals. This is a way to succinctly talk about uh, what you want to do. The introduction, the motivating case study of Chad draws the reader in and there's that twist uh, after that initial uh, description about the importance of oil um, to Chad's political stability and the involvement of international actors when it ends up turning out that there hasn't actually been any oil pumped out of the ground by the time that that coup happened. Um, we're going to talk about the causal mechanisms that um, Humphreys um, uh, differentiates with the different ways that natural resources can be tied into conflict, but it's just a really cool way to write a research paper, much bigger than any of my students would have to write uh, for your classes, um, but it's still something that repays rereading and thinking about how it's put together. Um, yeah, outlining the, the competing causal mechanisms and ways to try to test them, uh, to differentiate them. Uh, and then with the uh, Michael Ross, Literature review, for my literature review guide, I included uh, an excerpt um, from this page as well, highlighting the fact that there are debates in the field. Uh, any field, um, there are, uh, there's incomplete information, different people coming up for different explanations for the same outcomes, uh, and research questions that are motivating all of our research, whether or not it is a research paper or um, a literature review that we have to try to say, this is the question that we're, uh, we're asking, right? How does natural resources um, lead to, uh, to conflict? Um, what are the changes, uh, one of the challenges 
uh, in reaching those kind of findings and what are the normal implications of them, right? Um, so what kind of questions are we focusing on? Um, and I wanted to start uh, this introduction by getting your initial perspective on um, the topics for today and how they link into the topics in other weeks. Have you, have you ever thought about the global resource, uh, um, the global resource chain um, that goes into making our lives possible, whether it's transportation, whether it is communication, uh, whether it is uh, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat. Um, have you thought about what goes into that and um, which of these resources that we all have come to depend on um, that have negative effects worries, uh, worries you the most? Um, and how that, that worry is connected to one of the three themes of the class, right? Um, are you worried about the resources that we use and how it affects uh, the environment or what we take away from it? how it affects human security of the people that produce uh, the things that we produce or have to deal with the, um, the, the aftermath of this production uh, or the connections uh, to conflict, right? Or if not, uh, if these things you don't see as being uh, directly related to your life, why? We'd be interested to hear your perspective, um, answer the questions on Waddle after this first section, and then I can start with uh, a brief overview of um, natural resources, uh, how they're defined, what the resource curse is, uh, and then get into the, the reasons for why natural resources might be associated with conflict. So uh, respond on Waddle, and then we'll come back to the next section. I'm excited. This, this is, again, that topic that really um, got me interested in the field, and it's lost a bit of prevalence in the conflict literature, but I'd be interested to see how we might connect it to uh, our lives and the conflicts that we see around the world today.